Okay, good morning. So <clears throat> let's continue our study of consistency, stability, convergence. So last class, <clears throat> we saw the notions of consistency. We talked about stability in We mentioned convergence, right? So things <clears throat> that already mentioned the lax, I'm going to mention today a little more, <clears throat> the lax equivalence theorem where we can state it that these two things added equal this, which means equ equivalence, right? If and only if. <clears throat> so we saw that consistency implies sort of a like this proximity of two operators, right? Let me write this differential. And difference, right? Continuous and <coughs> excuse me, discrete. Okay, so let me go through uh, the next slide. So let me re remind you. Right now, I'm mostly following the book of Strict Verda, which is a science book. We have it here at the library. So. Let's see an example from th this book where <clears throat> some simple examples, but it's good for our intuition and so on, right? Method, a method is consistent, but not convergent, OK? Sorry, my handwriting. So <clears throat> here it is. So with the notation we were using before, the operator writes just a unidirectional wave equation. OK. And The, so strict pressure uses another notation like this to make a distinction between the solution of the discrete and the operator like this. And let me just indicate it like this, right? We're already talking to specialists, so you can see what I'm going to try to get at, right? Unidirectional notation of operators. Here's our PDE unidirectional wave equation. <clears throat> the wave is propagating in this direction, right? Positive speed. But we're using downwind, so it's going to go bad, OK? So it's going to go bad. <clears throat> so let's, let's check this. I mean, in all, not all details. And actually, what, um, so let me put, put some comments from, right? From, from the notes and from what I got from figures so instead of down upwind, this is actually downwind against the, the wind. So strict Verda writes, for example, certainly okay, where Let's remind ourselves. Right? 
Certainly, it's consistent because this, when this goes to zero, we get the derivative in time. Just calculus, right? This goes to zero derivative in space. And then, to show this, he, he considers the following. Consider with the following initial data. So strict vector considers this initial data. This part, because it makes the case simple. Right, this is u, and this is minus 1. <coughs> this square wave. OK, so basically, vj0 is equal to 1. If j delta x is less or equal to 0, and 0 otherwise. OK? <clears throat> and this numerical method can be written like this. Right? So this, as I mentioned, too, this is all very simple, just to call our attention to this fact that consistency will not. So this is our basically our recurrent recurrence relation where sigma is the current number the, the <coughs> speed and, and basically then in the notes and I, I think I got this from from Sturkveda kind of nice just to play a little bit like checkers check on the checkerboard with the molecule okay <clears throat> and you will see let me see I can repeat here what I did in the notes my drawing in the notes so here's just to indicate okay our molecule is like this OK. Let's see what else I did. Let's see, I did, um, suppose I have a grid where I think I have these three nodes. OK, so just a little graphics. Simple graphics way. OK, so what am I trying to show here? I mean, just one way to check graphically that it will not converge, OK, <clears throat> is that this is just to remind us of our molecule. Here it is. This is just to indicate, oops, I got to put here, say this is minus 1. This is 0. So suppose I have a grid, OK? and these three points are the points which are um, <clears throat> non-zero, right? So that we see how information will propagate. You will see, so I'll, I'll leave it to you, the, the, the drawing is in the notes. Like, for example, these points here, let me see, whoops, I'm going to do it. I did it a little differently. Yeah, let me make it here so I, I don't miss. The line. So these cases are going to be zero. And let me put with a different color. Let me put squares here. So check. I'm, I'm not going to put the notes, the, the values are here alone, but check that over the squares, not only the solution grows, OK, so it's already a sign of the instability, plus 
in this region here, we will never get any information. Okay? So let me put it like this. Just So how is this? Just you know, that's very easy to see. For example, let's look at this. Get this like check it's like playing on a checkerboard, right? With a molecule. You we put the molecule here. Okay? This is going to be right? You look with these guys. <clears throat> this will make um, this point here a value. Look this let me put this here. Right? Or, or let me put it here, sorry. It's going to be zero, different from value, something different from value here, and comes over here. Okay? And here the value is going to be growing, and here we're going to have nothing. And if we re refine this, it will not converge because the solution of this guy is this square moving in that direction. Right? So the, the details here in the notes, check this and see if. You, uh, you get this, okay? So for example, the notes, I'm doing it with sigma equal to one, which would be sort of the exact speed, right? So this would be one, this would be two, okay? And this will make things go bad on this grid. Yes, Mas? Yes. Yes, if the speed would would be ne if the speed were negative, it is. But see here, I have no choice, right? So it's just you're right. So if it's the downwind with a negative speed is actually the upwind, right? It's in the direction of the wind, so it would converge. But here is to show that, right? Here we have no choice of playing with the speed. The speed is one, right? And um, <clears throat> and, it, and and actually the sigma here current number, if we make it one, right, in this case, it will go, it, uh, it will go uh, bad, okay, in this, there will be no information here, yes? As time goes on, you will see things propagating here. This information of the square wave here will sort of propagate in this region, you can check that for sigma equal to one, it will grow here, which is a sign of instability, right? Because if it were stable, then whoop, it will contradict um, lux, right? Because you know that con it is consistent, so consistent stability would have would, would need to converge. But what I'm just doing here, and so is that the molecule already indicates to us that something's wrong and it's not going to converge, because in this region here. No information will get there where, for this equation, this wave should propagate in this direction. Okay? So it's just a quick way, right? There are many ways for you to check a quick way, but you also will see, do it on your own. There's your information that you will see that information over here on the zero will grow. So it's already a sign of instability. <coughs> so, very simple example. Okay? So, Strickverda puts his um, his version of a, of a well posner. So he says the following. is well posed
Okay, so this is basically, right, this is just the, the opposeness and the dependence on the initial condition. And it's actually the notion, a notion of stability, which the numerical method, right, will sort of, uh, we have to sort of uh, capture it in some similar way. So this is basically, Has to emulate. There's a little bit, I think, how Strick Verda is doing things. So basically, there's going to be a constant where you control, in terms of the initial data, right, the, <clears throat> the growth of the solution. So he calls this uh, some uh, no, book, like a, some, some sort of notion of well posedness. It's not really dependence, he's not putting it in terms of a continuous dependence as we saw everything on all information, right? But at least in this way that you have some control on the growth of the solution. It's more of a, a notion of stability, growth of the solution in terms of the size of, of the initial condition. And there's this constant that depends on the time interval we're looking at. So this is something that sort of goes along the lines of, um, of, um, of, of uh, the stability of the numerical methods, okay? So it, it appears in sometimes in slightly different forms, right? Sometimes this appears as a constant in some exponential term. Remember when we saw this for ODEs and we actually proved, go back and see the proof of the convergence of the Euler method, we had sort of a, an exponential term that depended on the Lipschitz conditions, on a, so right, so there's terms, of, it's okay that things grow. There's some exponential component, but you have control, right? Okay, so um, we will see, yeah, for initial value problems. So for finite difference, so we're gonna get sort of emulate this, so sort of some notion of stability that the numerical method will try, has to emulate, so an analog of this is what we'll define um, now. Okay, <clears throat> so let me see, I have some comments here, but it's in Portuguese, Let's see if to translate. Okay, the comments I'm not gonna write, but remember also that I already mentioned to you the method of lines that sometimes appears in English, the acronym MOL, method of lines. Method of lines is also a way of saying semi-discretization, right? So semi-discretization, so many of the things we're doing, say if you get this equation here, Okay, and you do a discretization in space like this, or even the better one, right? Then the semi discretization is that you, okay, will be thinking of you. Another term, another terminology I was, I'll start using more and more is I think of you as a grid function, right? What does it mean, a grid function? It's a function of space and time that when I put it on the grid, it becomes a vector that depends only on time, but continuously on time, right? So therefore, I can rewrite this PDE when I use semi-discretization, semi-discretization, or in the jargon, the method of lines, <coughs> excuse me, this becomes a system of ODs. Is that clear, or do I have to write? I mean, feel free to complain, okay? Right, just, so what I'm saying is this, if I do this, U, this is a grid function. When I, spe when I speak soon about spectral methods, Fourier methods, we're going to talk about grid functions and the frequencies that we can see in terms of Fourier when we restrict a function to a grid, right? So this, this, this guy here, right, I can actually put this notation, right? So it's, it becomes, this, this originally was a function, now it's a bit of a vector that depends on time. So therefore, if I keep time continuous, now it will be a total time, and it's like an OD, right? So that's one way 
of also studying stability many times is doing semi-discrete analysis where this then becomes a system of ODEs because I have N or capital J. Sometimes I use capital J for the number in space and capital N for the number of points in time. Right, so I have a, a system and we can look at, look at the eigenvalues of the system and so on. So, so there's many ways of looking at this. All right, so that's the method lines. There's a comment here in the notes. I won't write it. So the analog of this for a different scheme is the following. Let me translate this in real time. The different scheme. Boom. For the first order PD value equals zero is said. To be stable, so we're talking about something which is an initial value problem. If there exists an integer m and positive numbers h0 and k0 such that for time t, I mean any time t, right, greater or equal to 0, there exists a constant CT such that to define this norm. And this, uh, the Sri Kavarada calls this, I'll, I'll explain to you, L2. Okay, so let, let me read this again. See, since I'm translating from Portuguese to English in real time, let me see if it makes sense. The different scheme, blah, 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 for the first order initial value problem, PD, blah, blah, is said to be stable if there exists an integer m. So think about what this m means. I'll tell it to you in a second. And positive numbers, h naught and k naught, such that for time, I have to define these guys, I think I forgot. Time, this time, any time, T, capital T, there exists a constant, just like the one above, so that this is true. And, um, okay, I forgot to put here things, which is this, with um, well, this is trivial. This is the part I forgot, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Deal with my voice recovering from the trip. So you see, this, this is a way to write it. This stability condition, which as you will see, proving these things, finding these constants, 
sometimes is very, is very hard. Proving convergence is very hard. So that's why, for example, the equivalence theorem is, is good. But this is stability. Still, stability sometimes is hard. And then we're going to see a better way to check instability for problems with constant coefficients, which is something I think I'll have time to start talking today, which is the von Neumann analysis, which is namely a Fourier analysis. That makes our life simple. Okay? Remember that with ODs, so don't forget ODs, right? This, that's why I like starting this course with ODs. Remember that ODs, there's these, all these important theorems. Dahlquist was the first one to have a sort of an equivalence theorem, right, for ODs. Then Lax and Richmeyer has one for linear PDEs. The ODs one was, was Dahlquist was a little more general that it was okay for nonlinear non ODs. And then we saw that proving things for the ODs, in particular zero stability, which was a discrete analog of, well, poseness or stability of solutions, was kind of hard. But then we got the that theorem, which was looking at the zeros of polynomials, right? So the root condition, and that came in as, it's great when there's something that makes our life simple to check things, the root condition. Now, here, we're again in some conditions that are not so easy to check, the stability, blah, blah, but then we have the von Neumann, the Fourier analysis for certain types of methods, constant coefficients, blah, 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 and makes our life Simpler, okay? So these are a little bit analogs, right? <coughs> okay, and remember, remember, if you might not remember, I mean, right, some of these stuff are new, but if you go back to the definition of zero stability, we also had that we had to prove zero stability for, there were constants that said, well, at least for a delta t small enough, we can prove. So it's a little bit like, like here. See this k0, and this H0 is that if you can't find, this what it's saying this, it's saying is that if you can't find this constant for at least delta T, delta T and delta X small enough, right, then you're okay, right? That doesn't make our lives that, that much easier, but it doesn't mean you got to prove this for any, of course, because sometimes there's regions of stability, right? So this is what these guys mean. And this is a constant that depends on time. And the other comment I have to make, right, it's all just, I mean, in terms of concept, nothing complicated. To prove it, it might be complicated, but the concept is not complicated. And what is this L2 norm with its H here on the bottom? It's basically the following. Since we're de dealing with a discrete operator, V is not a function, it's a vector. But let's think of it, we can think of it as a grid function. Also because we're already thinking of not only stability, but convergence and so on. So what is the difference of a grid function and a vector? Sometimes we don't have no idea of anything, so we're just operating with a vector. Sometimes it's good to think that we have a function that's restricted to a grid, okay? So we're gonna see, for example, when I talk soon of, 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 of spectral methods, we're gonna talk about the Poisson summation formula. Who here has heard of the Poisson summation formula? Good, so every time there's something you haven't heard, it's good because more things to share. It's this, when you have a function, and think of Fourier, whatever, and you restrict it to a grid, you lose some information, right? So think of my fingers, the grid points. If I have something that's varying faster than my sampling, I lose that information. And that's what we're going to see soon, if maybe this week still, or maybe next week, notions of what is aliasing, right? We might have heard of aliasing, which is when a frequency is sampled poorly. So for example, let me, if I put my hand up and down like this, something's oscillating, right? And I ask Wellington at the end of the room, turn on the light on and off, okay, as fast as you can. But if I go much faster, or twice as fast as he's turning the light on and off, you're gonna see my hand always up here, not down there. So it looks like it's constant, it's not moving. That's aliasing, right? Or if, or if he does in another frequency and I'm going very fast, this is very cool, you know, you can see this in the experiment. If I'm moving this very fast and he turns the light on and off on a, 
on a slower frequency, but not slow enough that you don't see my hand static, you might see my hand moving in slow motion, which is very cool, right? I mean, it's not in slow motion, but it looks like in slow motion. So that all has to do with sampling. So going back to what I, I was talking is grid function. So, I, so we're going to see the Poisson summation formula, which is, shows us what are the frequencies you lose. You go to sort of, an, a, sort of a certain interval. OK, so here, right, we're going to then see, um, um, I don't know, I forgot why I went to, to talking about uh, the aliasing, the frequencies. Yes, because of, of going to Fourier. So, um, oh yeah, it has nothing to do for frequencies. I just decided to make a comment, and I almost lost track of myself and tell the story. And there's one more thing I have to tell you here. What is the M? Can you imagine what the capital M means? Sorry? Well, yes, like Adam. So it depends on the method in the sense that it depends if it's a single step or a multi step method. Okay? This is what this capital M means. Okay? So now I remember where I, start, where I, I started talking about aliasing, but let me finish this or else I'm going to open too many stories at once. So M is for a multi-step method, which means, oh, maybe I have to control things with the L2 norm of this grid function. That's why I started speaking of all these things, of this grid function, the L2 norm at different initial times. So think of this going M from 0 to 2. I have, I have to right? Time zero, one, and two, and th there's three steps, and I control this guy. No big deal, okay. And why was I talking about right here? I'm talking about um, grid functions. Is that right? I went from grid functions to then aliasing. That that's not now. I remember, is that basically to make the analog with <clears throat> the continuous case, strict Verda then is using. It's no big deal. Instead of using the L2 norm of a vector, he's using H here, which looks like an, a trapezoid rule, like an integration. You see? That's all there is. So basically, the L2 norm of a grid function is basically the trapezoidal rule, right? So it's basically a rescaling of the little L2 norm of the vector. Do you follow me? I almost lost track here. When I started talking about grid functions, I went to alias and that. Now I'm back to what I, what I wanted to say. So if I don't have, if I don't have this h here, this is just the L2 norm of a vector. <coughs> Excuse me. When I multiply by h, and I'm on the whole line, okay. And if I was in a periodic setting, the same thing. This is basically the trapezoidal rule of of, 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 the, of the grid function. So it's like a discrete capital L2 norm, as opposed that without this is the usual little L2 norm of a vector. No big deal, OK? So just so that things look like this, OK? And therefore, strict Verda calls this the capital L2 norm of the grid function. Because usually if, you talk, if I talk to you L2 norm of a vector, you think about the little L2 norm, which is this summation of the squares of, of the components. OK? That's all. So there's nothing. I end up making maybe the story more confusing, because there's no, nothing complicated conceptually here. And I just start anticipating things with grid functions of aliasing and so on. OK? So. Strickverde gives provides an, ex, an example. So let's do an example, like from Strickverde, where it says, look, there are some very simple methods, you know, discrete schemes, which actually he doesn't, you know, he doesn't specify the scheme in very detail. So we can think of this as a recurrence relation, where we can actually compute this guy. So let's do this exercise. Okay, it's simple, but not always we can. So therefore, the von Neumann analysis is very useful. The Fourier analysis is very useful, OK? So this is like an exercise or 
or a theorem because we're in a proof, so let me call it, I don't know, let me call it. The notes, it's a theorem, in the, in the book is an exercise. That doesn't matter. So consider the scheme. He calls it, let me put it a, progressive scheme like this. <clears throat> okay, so it says progressive scheme is stable if this is smaller than, than 1. OK, so we can think of this as a, as a little lemma, right? Prove that this progressive scheme is stable if this condition is satisfied, right? He, he writes in a way that I like an exercise, but then he sort of does the, the proof demonstration. And um, it's a scheme that you see. There's no, there's no alpha and beta quite specified, but this is a guy that we can see that has a molecule like this, right? Let's see. With look, which looked like our scheme that we saw before. Okay. <clears throat> and um, again, so this is basically a progressive scheme or just a To some extent, a recurrence relation in time. Sometimes we, we might be doing things that has a recurrence relation. And um, as I mentioned before, there are books, for example, a book that has very many things related to recurrence relations is Bender and Orzag, right? So I already mentioned this to you. OK, so let's check, or let's demonstrate since I wrote it, not as a lemma, let's check. How do we do this? OK, so we're going to find basically something similar to this. So let's try to write this in a way that we have a L2 norm of a grid function. And we're on the, the whole line. OK, so this is, you see what I did? No big deal, right? Just using the definition, multiply and divide by delta x, summed over so that I can write this guy, just so I can write it as the L2 norm of the grid function. OK? No big deal. So now I'm going to skip one line of the notes, OK? And I'm going to write it, but I'm going to tell you what I'm doing, but I'm not going to write it. So I'm going to write this like this. So it's basically using triangle inequality, right? This is all we want to do here. Use triangle inequality, and you can write this like this. I hope it fits here. I think it will. Let me write like this in a way that um, So what, what have I done here? I hope I, I wrote it right because I'm looking here and I skipped two things just to save time. Look what I did. This, my triangle inequality, is small, right, is smaller than this, plus this squared, okay? Plus, I mean, first, sorry. First, do the square. So you're gonna get this squared, this squared, and two times this times this, okay? So you get three, three components, okay? Then triangle inequality, it's going to be smaller than each component separately. And then 
this guy that's going to be two times this guy times this, okay, I can already write it. Do I have it right? No, I think I have to put the two here. Yeah, see, I did it too fast. It's already expressed by this, but then since I'm summing everybody from minus infinity to infinity, who cares if I have j plus 1 or j? So I just put everybody as j. OK, cool. And then it comes out here. OK? And therefore, with this guy here, OK, yeah, I have this right. This guy here, do I have that? And um, oh, and I forgot the delta x. Because I'm still integrating. Okay. Now, this guy here, I want to write it similar to this. This is like 2xy is smaller or equal to x squared plus y squared, because it's a square, right? x minus y squared. Okay. So therefore, I can write this as smaller or equal to to this. Or I mean this guy here. I don't I think I don't I have done this before, so you check. Right? And this is smaller. To this, j put to zero. OK, so double check the steps, right? This is just doing coming back, using this several times to come back to this. And therefore, we get the result that this will, will be stable if this guy is smaller than 1, so it will not grow in time, right? And this is like our, our constant. This is like our discrete constant, C capital T, because this n is connected to the, the time, OK? So I'm leaving some steps for you to check, but easy steps, OK? So this is a very simple case where we can actually compute the constant, OK? <clears throat> and actually, um, if we wanted to do the notation correctly, right, I should have put it the little h here and the little h here following the notation that it is the L2 norm on, for a grid function. I don't even remember now if Strick Verda, he puts this little h some places, and if he has dropped it because, you know, it's already obvious. OK. So another, another thing, so just, just another thing that um, I already mentioned here, but this streak Veda calls, uh, calls attention to, this is very simple, but I want to call your attention again. Okay, so we have to always have in mind that we that numerical stability is something different from dynamical stability or dynamic stability. Okay, soon I'm going to present to you a problem that I teach it both it in the numerical, in the not the numerical the the PDEs course in applications. I also teach it in the fluids course. And I like to present it here. So those of you who had done fluids and PDs with me know, which is a problem with singular integrals and an instability problem for an interface. Why do I like to show it to you? Because it's a problem, a genuine problem, where we have a dynamic instability, but we can have associated with it some numerical instability, which is spurious. We got to take care of the numerical instability so we can study the appropriate dynamic instability and blah, 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 blah. And also 
how can I integrate numerically, right, a singular integral, an integral that does not make sense in the Riemann sense, and it's a very good object in terms of modeling. So for those of you who did PDEs with me, or even fluids, I've already sort of sold you the idea that this is an interesting object. So I'll do a quick review. This will come in maybe two weeks or more, right? But I want to call attention that, right, we have, we have to have in mind these things. And there's actually, in this interface problem, unfortunately, there's papers that are doing, talking about the numerical instability as if it were a dynamic instability, which is wrong. I think I already mentioned to you, right, the name of a conference which I thought was very good, which is the numerics of dynamics and the dynamics of numerics, right? So this is a very good case to see that. So, okay, so strict Verda actually has a little paragraph calling attention to this. So that's why I wanted to repeat. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm not going to prove, but I'm going to mention the Lox, sometimes called just the Lox equivalence theorem, Rox, Rixmeyer. Theorem, many times also called Locke's equivalent theorem, which says that um, for, let me put it like this, a linear initial value problem, right, talking about PDs, which is well posed, A consistent finite difference method is convergence, convergent if and only if it is stable. So many times this theorem appears like this, consistency plus stability equals convergence. Okay? So many times it appears like this. So <clears throat> this is stated earlier in the book. It's proved in many places. You can have the proof of it in Strict Verda, chapter 10. Okay, it's like a f proof, four pages long. I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna go into the proof, I think, right? <clears throat> and I wanna mention this. Um, it's in, if you check Strict Verda's book, Strict Verda is a very good book, organized and so on, but sometimes there's a few things that sort of uh, one has to be careful. For example, he does not, when he, presents the theorem, it does not say explicitly that this is for a linear PDE. In the chapter, there's only linear PDEs. In other books, and like Rick Meyer, Mort, and other ones, it's explicitly mentioned that this is for linear um, PDEs. Uh, also Isaacson and Keller, many books that some have proofs, some don't. It's okay. And um, so you see, this is a very, very um, good Beautiful theorem, right? Stated like this, looks like it's simple, not that simple. This is always very easy to check. This stability, in principle, is not, might not be so easy, but the von Neumann theory helps us in this direction, and then we get the, the convergence for linear um, evolution PDs. Okay, so things related to stability. Let me talk about uh, Current Friedrichs Levy known as the CFL 
condition, which is from 1928, I think. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's interesting because it's a, it's a theorem. It's a, that became known as the CFL condition. So uh, it basically came out of a theorem, 1928, where they're trying to prove things that related to existence and you know analysis of, in analysis of, of PDEs. And many times, existence of solutions, if you think of the Picard method for ODs, the Picard method is an iterative method, right? Which is looked a little bit like, it's a very simple, it's not very good to implement in a computer, but it's, it's like a numerical method, right? You successive approximations. So many proofs sometimes for PDEs goes a little bit along the lines of the method of lines. You do a sort of a discretization in space and, and so on. And as you go along, basically in the proof to prove that there exists a solution, you're proving like a, a convergence proof. And then they found their, um, right, the condition that became um, the famous CFL condition. Okay, so the CFL condition Right? We already saw it this through the current number, right? So in, in the case we saw it was the current number less or equal to one. Okay? But then if you know that that was the case, we saw that very simply, I mean in a very simple way for the upwind. And how did we see it? One way to see it is we saw it through the modified equation. So do you remember what I'm talking about? The modified equation, and we saw somehow the CFL condition has in, having its impact on the diffusion term that showed up in the CFL condition and basically shown that if CFL condition is violated, that means the current number greater than one, we get negative diffusion, which we know is an ill-posed problem, right? Looking at the dispersion relation of a heat equation, you see that high frequencies will grow in an unbounded fashion. That makes sense to you, right? We've, we've seen this. Okay. So strict weather pre presents a, a set of, uh, so this is again in strict weather. We have the following. simpler version which okay we it's it's things come later okay the following simple version, with, which is like this. The CFL condition is necessary for the stability of explicit schemes in the form now let me put this way again translate explicit consistent schemes in the form for the Solution of right, our unidirectional equation.
Oh, I know what I did. I did, I did a, sorry. I did a mistake. I'll come back to this then. Uh, let me do this. I'll come back. Yeah, I'm okay. I had some sort of notes from there to come back. And then. Okay, in the case, just an observation. In the case of systems, alpha, beta, gamma, are matrices and as we saw, Condition corresponds to, okay, we already know this, right? Where lambdas are eigenvalues of the matrix, right? Which are all the speeds, okay? So in the scalar case, So strict vector does also a simple way, which is which you can see through a little bit like that other one of molecules for this guy. <coughs> so he does the following. So I'll, I'll sketch for you. So let sigma be greater than one, and take as. Initial condition um, the following. Let's see. How can I write this? Because I did the drawing. Um, only one node. This is a good way of with a non zero value. Okay, so the idea that Sukhvedo does like this to see that this has right, it has if you violate things, you're you're in bad shape. So it puts this node value one. All the other ones, zero. Okay, so this is the only point that's one. On all the other ones are zero. Okay, and he puts this point, sorry, I should have put this on top. And he puts this point on purpose at location minus C. And let's see, one, two, three, one, two, three. This would be point C. <coughs> okay. So now we need to keep, so keep. As we okay, so we're going to see that things get bad if we keep right, if we use a bad 
current number, greater than one. So as we refine, keep this, um, keep this um, constant. So now check that, for example, at this point here, 0, 1, Okay, so using, using the molecule, this is a molecule with three points, right? So check, right, using again just with, with so you want to see, I, I, I stopped here, so I, I lost the, the flow of things from translating. So we want to show that we need to have the condition later, greater or equal to one for it to, to convert. So let's violate the condition and show that it does not converge. That's the idea by streak further, okay? And then with the molecule, check, right? And this is in the notes, check that it will not converge. For example, at this point, okay, zero, one. And, 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 and the thing is that you also have to check, I will not draw here, is that the CFL condition means that the domain of dependence, and this is what's going to happen here. So there's a little bit of an exercise for you. There's a little more information in the notes, not much more than I'm speaking, but then you can check it Sri further. So here's two things to see. That if you check this with the molecule and this guy here, it will not converge at this point, zero, one. And the reason is because the domain of dependence of the numerical method is smaller than the domain of dependence of the, of the PDE. Okay, so the domain of dependence of the difference equation is smaller than the domain of dependence of the PDE. So therefore, this information here, right, will not reach this guy here, okay? So check these things, right? That's why this guy's at minus C. And that's basically a way of showing that, look, if you, it, it, if suppose that this is consistent with, with the equation, right, the alpha, beta, gamma, but you violate this guy, right, you will not, you will not get the, the right solution. It will not converge here. So it's a simple exercise, again, a little bit playing with the geometry. That's why the molecule is easy, is good, because you see how it sort of, quote unquote, sort of populates our space-time grid. Populates in what sense? With information, right? How information propagates. And here you will see that, you know, if you keep this constant and so on, right, it will never get to this guy. Let me go back to some comments on the Rick Meyer um, and Lax thing that I, I skipped because I called it pages 37A and B, and then I went to the CFL. But it's no big deal because I think some of them I already uh, mentioned. So for the Rick Meyer, I'm not going to write them more because it's just blah, blah, blah. You have in the notes, and, but it, they're comments. So the, the strict Verda right, mentions that the Lax um, equivalence theorem the, the proof he has is for a single step, but it can be done for several steps, right? It's um, Pamut steps. It, um, it can be done, it can be extended to non-homogeneous problems. So non-homogeneous problems, right, means you have a forcing term, but then when you have a forcing term, you can rewrite things using the Duhamel principle. So I mentioned this in the PDS course, if you haven't heard it, it's just a way of transforming things into a homogeneous problem with, with, with conditions changing in time, okay? Not important here because, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fact to know. And it can be used for, um, it can sort of be used for variable coefficients. So this is one thing I wanted to mention. Some of the analysis that can be done when we have variable coefficients and unless you have complicated, I think, variable coefficients, is what's called the method of frozen coefficients. So think of this. This is kind of intuitive, okay? 
right? So let's think, uh, where is my PDE? Here. OK, this is kind of intuitive. What is the method of frozen coefficients? It's kind of intuitive. Think that, um, I already actually mentioned this to you. Think that this C here changes, for example, in space, right? Because I have, like we saw before, the, the problem like that the, it's a heterogeneous medium. The acoustic problem, the speed changes like this through the layers. The water wave problem changes like this because of the depth. In that case, it was a system, right? Here, it, we can think of this as a unidirectional guy, which is not a very good idea if this is variable. I mean, you still can do it, but right? you can have things moving to the right and to the left. So it's, I call this unidirectional, right? You're going to have different reflections. But what would you do, the CFL condition? Well, you think of this as frozen coefficients, which means Oh, it's constant here, it's constant there, it's constant there, and you go with the more most adverse condition. Right? And and and, and this is actually something I've never I never played with this, I must confess, in the computer, and I was checking my notes and also Streak Verde, and he says that actually if you have if you do the frozen coefficient situation where the speed here is slower. There it's faster, there it's slower, and I have to keep track of things regarding the fastest speed, right? Which is the more stringent one. And Strickverder says something that I've never checked in the computer to see it appearing, that if you violate, for example, the CFL condition only, say, in a region, let's, let's pretend only in one region, right? You will see actually only things getting unstable or growing in that region and not quite contaminating the rest. That I'm not so sure, depending on the problem, if it won't contaminate the rest because things will grow there. But an interesting thing to check on, 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 on the computer, OK? OK, so that's one comment, frozen coefficients. Yes, that was an important one. Yeah, and restricted to one region. OK. OK, and another comment that, um, that I have it here might be, I think, might see it later on or do it as an exercise, is that another comment is that the C for explicit PDEs, Right, linear hyperbolic PEs, the CFL condition is necessary, but sometimes not sufficient for stability. Okay, so there are examples where things might go wrong. Okay, and um, let me just get started. Then I, I thought today I was going to speak. Let me just get started with because it's a quick review of Fourier for us to do next class. Start talking about the von Neumann stability, OK? So let's remind ourselves very simple things of Fourier analysis. And it's good also because they will start putting our minds in terms of Fourier. And then we'll go at one point and switch books to spectral methods, spectral Fourier methods, right? Spectral methods, they're different, different classes. But spectral Fourier methods are more intuitive. And there's a very good book on that, that's also for us to read, which is a book by Trefethen, Spectral Methods in MATLAB. <coughs> Excuse me. OK, let's start talking about the von Neumann analysis. Right, which is, is not the same Neumann as Neumann conditions, right? It's a different Neumann. More. So <clears throat> let's talk then notions like this of Fourier analysis. Very simple one, very, very simple things. Re re refresh our memory of Fourier analysis. And with now, with, with me trying to put a, a jargon, right? It's simple stuff for you, Fourier analysis. 
a Fourier series and so on, but starting to put the sort of a jargon of numerical, right, Fourier analysis. Okay, so we have this, right, this constant here is a little bit arbitrary, so we have to be specified. Sometimes it will change. I hope I remember to mention to you because of the book when it changes, right? So this is our Fourier coefficient, right? So this is basically out of a Fourier transform, right? We're on the whole line. And this is our inversion. Okay, so this is the transform. Okay, this is what I will call my Fourier coefficient, right? And right, and another way of, of thinking of this is this is the amplitude of, this is the jargon I use, right, of this Fourier mode. Here's the Fourier mode, okay? So we're superimposed, just jargon, okay? This guy can be complex and so and so. So we have K is a wave number, just 2 pi over lambda which is a bit like our, so our spatial frequency. Okay, and, and, and U is <coughs> defined to hold the line, okay. <coughs> All right, I thought I wasn't gonna get to this page, but it's good, because then I'm gonna talk about a grid function. Excellent. So for grid functions, I have the following. So let me change the notation for the time being. At some point, I won't care so much. Changing from u to v, you will know what I'm talking about. Look what I have. <clears throat> okay, this will be a, maybe a good part. I mean, I have to make some comments. I'm not going to finish now, but this is a good point to finish our class, right? I have some minutes to talk about this. So look at this. <coughs> Excuse me. If I compare this with this, Right? This is our function, this is our function, and this is the Fourier content of that function. Okay? Now V is a grid function. So basically I have V, and I sample it. Right? And I sample it. Tung, 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 tung. Right? When I sample the, grid, the, the function, right, then <clears throat> this is, compared to this, what is this? This is the discrete Fourier transform, let me put it here, DFT. Soon I will talk about the FFT, which is a fast Fourier transform, which is an algorithmic way of dealing with this guy, right? This guy is, is order n squared. This is just trapezoid rule, right? This is just a, pro a trapezoid rule approximation of this integral, right? Here are the grid points, delta x, right? And the trapezoid rule, which is like this, and then put this, 
It's half here, but half there. It's just summing all the points. Right? So this is just a trapezoid rule of this guy. So it's the discrete Fourier transform. And it's order n squared for each point. I sum if I were in a finite interval. Right here, I'm in the whole line. But if I were in the finite interval and I had n points, for each point, I do n operations, so it's order n squared. And the FFT is a smart way when it's a powers of 2, blah, blah, blah. There's a, st a tree structure, blah, 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 blah. And the algorithm by Cooley Tucky in 1967, I think, was able to reduce this, or 71. I always forget the, the date. I have it written here somewhere. Yeah, 65, right? They were able to reduce the order from n squared to n log n. And when n is already a thousand, whatever it's a, which is very, we use it as a thousand, it, it makes things super fast, right? Much faster. Okay. So just note here, okay? Now, not all frequencies are represented. So k belongs to this interval. Okay. <clears throat> Where basically this implies that lambda belongs to this interval. the lambdas, right? So we have, for example, we have when the lambda is 2 delta x, right? And when we're in a finite interval, we have that, for example, the fastest mode, the fastest mode that we can, rep we can see on this grid is, the, is called the sawtooth mode. I'm going to, we're going to talk about this guy later on, the Nyquist frequency. The sawtooth mode is the mode related to the fastest cosine we can see, which is this. Which is actually this wave here, right? But on the grid, we only see plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, okay? And it's called sawtooth mode because if you do the graph of it, it looks like a sawtooth. Then you just say, huh? Okay? So this is the fastest mode you can see on the grid. Anything faster than that will be aliased. We'll talk this about, about this next week. For example, if I look at the, if this, at the cosine, which is twice as fast as this one, right, which, which would be like this. This is the cosine, which is twice as fast as this. How do I see it on the grid? As a constant. So it gets aliased to the frequency 0. Right? It's that thing I did with my hand. I asked somebody to sh switch the light on and off. And it's synchronized with my hand that you switch the line on, the, the lights on every time my hand's up here. So you're not turning the light fast enough. And it looks like my hand is not moving, it's constant. Right? Okay? So we'll talk about this in a more def definite way in the next class. So this is this is then nothing more. This is nothing more than the trapezoid rule of this guy. Okay? And the frequencies k that we can see are only in this interval. Okay. <clears throat> so this this is well here I have infinite, doesn't matter. Okay, so if I were just in the finite interval, <coughs> I'm talking about FFTs. And um, and on the grid, this is the last, last thing I maybe I should mention, is the inversion formula for this guy is this.
Okay, so for the for the for the grid function. Okay, so for the grid function, as soon as I get the function, okay, suppose I got a function. Here it is. I restrict it to a grid. Boom. So it becomes this vector. Right? Then it becomes this vector. Right? From, from, from here, it becomes this vector. I look at its discrete Fourier transform. I am losing information of a certain band of frequencies, the fast ones, okay? And if I want to come back, right, from this spectrum, which has a sort of already been filtered by my sampling, why filtered by my sampling? Or aliased is a better word, aliased by my sampling. It's not filtered because I'm not throwing away, it's aliased. It's been repositioned in the spectrum, like, this one becomes like a constant, okay? Then it, when I come back, this is, right, how I see my, my grid function again. Okay, th this is the inversion. But here, for the time being, here it's, it's, it's continuous because I'm on the whole line. Okay, that's the last comment I want to make. Because I'm on the whole line, right? Because I'm on the whole line, I have these two bands of wave numbers uh, because of these 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 uh, wavelengths. Okay, when we are on a finite interval, on a finite interval, we don't have a Fourier. In particular, let's think now of a finite interval, right? It's we don't have a Fourier transform. We have a Fourier series because because only a discrete number of waves fit in that interval. Only a discrete number of modes or in, right, discrete and countable number of modes fit in on that interval. So it's a sum instead of an integral, right? Okay, so we'll see this back in next class and we'll see what I mean more precisely mathematically by alias and so on. Maybe not in the next class because I'm gonna talk about the von Neumann, but then uh, maybe next, next, not next class, who knows, maybe not. But yeah, I don't think, but next week we'll talk about spectral methods, I think, and we'll see this thing of aliasing, what is the Poisson summation formula, so an exact way of seeing how aliasing takes place and so on. So these are things for the next classes, okay? So this is a good start for us to talk next class of then doing a Fourier analysis of our discrete scheme, our discrete operator, and it makes our life simpler. Okay? Okay, thank you.